Our next evolutionary process that we'll be looking at, um, we'll be looking at non-random mating. So you'll recall one of the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium scenario was that all mating was random. So we'll be looking at non-random mating. In particular, we'll be looking at a um, phenomenon called assortative mating. So that's a technical term. And so assortative mating is when individuals kind of sort themselves into different mating groups. And there's what's called positive assortative mating. That's where similar genotypes mate more often with one another. And that's distinguished from negative assortative mating, where dissimilar genotypes mate more often. So an example of this is seen in a plant called the primrose. And primroses have a um, trait called heterostyly that's going to lead to negative assortative mating. And heterostyly works in the following way. If we look at a diagram of the flower, the female structure um, can sometimes be held at great distance from the flower with the male structures close. And when we have this kind of morphology of these flowers, this is referred to as a pin structure, right? So you've got the kind of the pollen close to the, the base, and then the receptacle to receive pollen and fertilize um, further away. And then there are other plants within the same population where the female structure is um, lower and the male structures are actually held out much further. And this structure is called thrum. And the way that this leads to negative assortative mating is um, depending on what the type of pollinator is. So if a pollinator, say like a bee, which lands on the flowers, arrives on a pin, it'll walk around on the flower, it'll get the pollen all over itself, and then when it flies to another flower, if it lands on another pin, it'll just pick up some more pollen. Only when it lands on a thrum will it transfer that pollen into the um, female portion of the plant and fertilize that plant. So the pollinators that land are taking gametes from pin and delivering them to thrum, but they won't be delivering them in a useful manner to other pin. On the other hand, um, pollinators that kind of stay at a distance, like hummingbirds, so their beaks will um, drink nectar, but their bodies will be further away and will pick pollen from the thrums. When they go to another thrum, um, they'll just be kind of getting more pollen. It's only when they then go to a pin that they'll be transferring that pollen um, to the female part of the flower. So those pollinators will be taking gametes from thrum to pin. And so this results in negative assortative mating because it causes pin individuals to mate with thrum individuals, thrum individuals to mate with pin individuals, much more than they mate with the same phenotype, which is caused by a similar genotype. So that's an example from kind of the plant world. We can look at what sort of mating we see in humans. In humans, it turns out most negative assortative mating is actually pretty rare. In human populations, we tend to sort ourselves um, in positive assortative mating manners, right? So height, tall people tend to mate with tall people, short people tend to mate with short people. Studies have shown that IQ kind of works the same way, high IQ with high IQ, low IQ with low IQ. IQ is a complicated and contentious trait, but some degree of it is genetically determined, and so there are genes involved. And a number of other factors that are examined all show that humans in general tend to exhibit positive assortative mating. So what are the consequences of assortative mating? And we'll look at kind of more details of this in a second. But in general, with negative assortative mating, what that's going to do is it's going to increase heterozygosity. So remember, heterozygosity is kind of the proportion of individuals who are heterozygous. And what's going to end up happening is the frequency of these heterozygous individuals is going to be larger than 2PQ, right? The prediction from Hardy-Weinberg. Positive assortative mating 
is actually going to reduce heterozygosity. and result in a population where the frequency of the heterozygotes is actually less than 2pq. So let's look at a, a numerical example of this. So for our numerical example, what we're going to do is we're going to consider kind of an extreme example. Let's think about full inbreeding. So in other words, um, individuals will only mate with the exact same genotype as themselves. This will be positive assortative mating. So let's kind of set up a population here. So these individuals, these are our three different genotypes in the population, and they will be mating with individuals of the same three genotypes. But with full inbreeding, so this is either individuals mating only with themselves or individuals only mating with other individuals who exactly match their genotype, this genotype will only mate with this genotype, and they'll produce offspring that look like this. This genotype only mates with this genotype, and they'll produce offspring in these proportions. And this genotype only mates with this genotype, and all their offspring are so. And in this kind of extreme example, we're not going to have any observations of this genotype mating with this genotype or any of these other locations. So now let's think about what happens to the frequencies or the new frequency of the capital A homozygous individuals. Well, the frequency of this genotype is P squared, and all their offspring are capital A. So the frequency of capital A homozygous offspring will be the frequency of um, that genotype um, in the previous generation, plus those individuals are produced by a quarter of these matings. And how frequent are those matings? Well, those matings are occurring at frequency 2pq. If that's the starting frequency of our heterozygote, all of them are um, doing this mating, and a quarter of them are the capital A homozygotes. So just rewriting this, we would get this. What's our new frequency of heterozygous individuals? Well, they can only arise from here and here. So heterozygous individuals will be one half of the 2pq, and that will reduce down to p. The new frequency of the lowercase a homozygotes is q squared, because that's the proportion of these guys plus one quarter of those matings, those matings occurred at 2pq. And so you have um, this simplification here. And so what we can see has kind of happened here is the frequency of this genotype and this genotype is becoming more common than it started off in the previous generation. The frequency of this genotype is becoming less common than it was in the previous generation, because essentially what's happening is that some of those individuals are kind of moving into these other genotypes. And so in the long term, there'll be fewer and fewer of these and more and more of those. So let's just do a really quick numerical example. If we started off with equal frequencies of our two genotypes, our initial frequencies, sorry, equal frequencies of our two um, allele frequencies. Now let's think about the frequencies of our genotypes. To start off, p squared, so 0 0.25, 2pq, 0.5, q squared, 0 0.25. After one generation of this extreme inbreeding, these frequencies would change to become 0 0.375, 375, 25. If you have another generation of this extreme inbreeding, again, half of these individuals will move, uh, their offspring will move into those homozygous groups, and the homozygous groups will stay the same and then receive extra individuals from the heterozygotes. Each generation, those heterozygous individuals are getting more and more rare, and generation by generation, these will kind of disappear, and these guys will persist. Um, one thing to think about is, okay, so 
if this is happening and these genotype frequencies are changing, what's happening to the allele frequency? Well, the allele frequency, this capital A, it's given by the frequency of that genotype, right? The capital A homozygous genotype, um, the frequency of that genotype will give us the frequency of the allele. And then we have to add one half of the frequency of the heterozygous individuals in order to get the total frequency of this capital A allele. And so when we do that, we get um, P squared plus PQ, right, adding those two terms together. And then we can take a P outside of this, P plus Q. P plus Q, as we uh, saw many times before, is just equal to one. So the frequency of this capital A allele after this process has been going on, the frequency of that allele actually stays the same. So what does that mean? That means for this inbreeding, the effects of inbreeding, while the genotype frequencies will change so that they are no longer those predicted by the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, right? so this is genotype frequencies changing. The actual allele frequencies, when this inbreeding is occurring or when this very strong positive assortative mating is occurring, those allele frequencies are actually still um, P and Q. So the allele frequencies don't change. And that kind of shows another one of the weaknesses in our definition of evolution. When we started population genetics, we defined evolution as change in allele frequencies. Under this definition, with this strong positive assortative mating, no evolution is occurring because the allele frequencies aren't changing. On the other hand, we know that something is happening because the genotype frequencies are changing. So our definition of allele frequencies changing the thing that is evolution is also missing this, right? When we first started the section, we described how it was missing learned behavior and epigenetics. This is another change in a population that could potentially be important, because there are fewer and fewer heterozygotes, that would not be uh, included in our a very strict definition of evolution as allele frequency change.